Ah, welcome back to week four, everybody. Well, I hope you had a, a lovely week, and uh, thank you for submitting so many wonderful assignments, which I just can't wait to spend the next year marking. <laughs> um, yeah, they're all in, most of them. Um, there's about 20-odd missing. I'm not sure what's happened to those, so uh, we'll see what happens. I will endeavour to mark them as quickly as I can, but since there's over... Uh, 110 of them, it might take me a couple of weeks because uh, I've got two other units coming as well. So please don't don't chase me too quickly for them. So this 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 week we're going to have a look at just the traditional town planning, and we're not going into the nitty gritty of it at the moment. We're just going to have a little look at the history of uh, how planning sort of developed gradually. So from the development of town planning. Uh, original human settlements, um, they developed to form or to provide our survival needs, everything we needed. Uh, originally that would have been food and shelter, etc. Nowadays it's, it's still shelter, but it's to provide us with recreation and access to work. Um, it's always located near fresh water, even though you'll find um, towns, villages and cities in the Middle East, etc., which are not near water nowadays. There would have been originally uh, a water source for them. Um, they're generally in a defendable, defendable position, i.e. they're elevated, they're on a hill on top of a mountain, um, or sometimes they may actually build them as an island. Uh, you can have a moat around them or actually on an island. Uh, and they very quickly adopted security perimeters, fences basically, and then they turned into walls. Uh, partly for defence, but partly to keep the animals in. And there, because we'd started to domesticate animals. So, early on in Stone Age, so early humans he lived in caves generally in Europe initially, uh, then moving out into, into huts and small buildings. Um, in warmer climates, tended to use, again, they did use caves, but they tended to use more tent-like structures because the uh, environment was nicer to live in. Uh, back into Africa, they would just live in the forest or the savannah. They started to, to have some shade with some basic grass-covered buildings. The Stone Age settlements they developed around houses and um, Scarbray in Scotland, you can go and Google that one if you want, is an example of a, a large settlement where they actually constructed the bases of the buildings with stonework and slate and then they had a, a lean-to timber roof covered in grass and straw. An example there you've got the, uh, the conical roof. You can see there's a, a stone wall around the bottom of it. This is quite an advanced one. It has a door. Um, the timber poles just chop down trees. All meet at the top. And then they've covered this one with thatch. So there's straw or reed. You can't see. Uh, traditionally, they would have had a hole in the roof to let the smoke from the fire in the centre of the building. And a number of families would live in this one building together. And in inclement weather, they'd take the animals in there as well with them. Uh, this is the uh, Scar Bray thing from Scotland. It uh, just shows the layout. Uh, you can see the stone bases on these. And most of these would have had a similar thatched roof on them. Always put your copyright in. At Bronze Age, uh, we're well into fenced settlements by then. Things were getting a little more um, competitive and violent in the countries. So you end up here, so you've got a house that's completed in the middle, a round house. A uh, couple of them being constructed. There's the outdoor uh, fire. There's the beginnings of some agriculture over on the left. You've got some animals going around. There's some pigs by the look of it in their own fenced off area. The whole thing's fenced in just to keep the animals in and for protection. Walled settlements. We move away from fences and we start getting into some walled ones again for protection. Um, more so 
than the early settlements where they kept the animals in. This is really for protection now. So some examples of some well-preserved walled cities. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. This one's in Italy. Um, it's on top of a natural hill. So they're looking down on the surrounding countryside so they can shoot down on anybody trying to get in. Uh, it's a medieval walled town, around about the 13th century. Uh, they're all stone walls. Um, there is, as you can see, if we look carefully at the picture, there are towers. Um, there's a couple of main entrances in, which can be fortified. And you can see the houses in the centre there. There's a church and almost like a piazza. So it was a very nice place to live. But if you go to Italy, you'll find an awful lot of the, the hilltop towns and villages are very much like this. We'll have a look at another one. You can see this one's quite a nice one. It's got all those nice round castellated towers all the way around it and a, quite a large town and possibly in the distance could be almost a cathedral there. Uh, this one is a Spanish town, a villa, built around the 11th to 12th century. It's pretty, pretty violent there at those times. Um, again, it's on the summit of a, of, a, of a rocky hill, so you're looking down on uh, most, of the, most of the people around you. Um, it's got nine gates with ramparts and 88 towers, and it's still intact at the moment. And the original streetscape inside, all higgledy-piggledy, not straight intersecting lines, uh, had an organic development inside. As you see from lots of villages, there's quite an organic design. We look at those later on in the course. This one people should probably know. Um, obviously it's developed for maritime trade right on the coast. Uh, wonderful looking um, walls. Quite a large sentry tower. That's Dubrovnik uh, in Croatia on the Adriatic. Um, it actually it outperformed Venice for a short while because Venice is just across the Adriatic on the other side. Um, the walls of the city They've been constructed over a long period of time, 12th to the 17th century. Um, there are other, uh, other examples I could give you. If I were to go to Wales in Britain, there's a, there's a little town there called Conway in North Wales. And it's, got, it's not as big as this, but it's got the same sort of, the walls are still there. And they open out down onto the dock. So you could Google Conway, you can Google any of these to find out more information on how they developed. Uh, castles, well, we can't go away without the castle. Um, there's a concentric, symmetrical castle. Uh, so, obviously, there's not a lot left at the moment, but it's got a moat around most of it to try and keep the baddies away. Uh, you've got the outer curtain wall with towers in, and then you've got the inner walls, and that's where you would have lived in the inner walls and buildings inside. So it's got several layers of protection. So it's got a moat, an outer wall, an inner wall. As I said, concentric symmetrical design. Four lines of fortifications, because there's some internally as well. Uh, and this was the state of the art design in the 13th century. These were being built all over Britain and all over Europe at the time. Little picture of this one. This one's in North Wales. Just to show you, there you go, there's a tower. You can see the way it steps higher and there's the moat around it. Uh, Bomoris Castle started in 1295. Uh, it was the largest, but it was also the last of a massive castle building program that King Edward I had in Wales. Um, they did really well until gunpowder was invented. But everything was contained within those walls for protection. Uh, food from surrounding farms and villages would be brought in to the castle and at a time when it was uh, dangerous, they were being attacked, most of the villages would be brought inside the castle for protection. Now, look at someone like Paris. Paris is a nice place. Uh, Paris started off in medieval times, literally is that. Um, you can see the island in the middle, and you can see where Notre Dame is, and there's a university. 
and then it is connected out by radiating small roads going out to villages and farms that served the city itself and again at times when it was getting dangerous most of the surrounding population would be brought inside those city walls so that's medieval Paris and of course it continues to develop so let's have a look at Paris in about 1615 quite a while after medieval and as you can see you can see there's the island with Notre Dame in the middle you can still see the walls going around them and you can see they've actually got a second line of defence in the walls with the little uh, arrow bits sticking out of them so you've got two walls now uh, the river's walled off mostly it's walled on both sides but notice the developments beginning to spread outside the walls on the right hand side so the walls are becoming less important by now have a look at London doesn't take long to look at London um, there's a, a recreation of Roman London uh, with its first bridge so they're developing on both sides of the River Thames just a map to try and explain what we're looking at there so you can see some early buildings there um, just so you can get your your bearings we do have St Paul's Cathedral and the Tower of London in grey on this one so you get a feeling for the size of Roman London so it was quite a large city in its day uh, with basilicas and had a small amphitheatre um, the bottom part if you look down the bottom part of the river the land on the bottom uh, doesn't look like that anymore because a lot of it was drained and filled in And just a little example of something there. This, this chap is sitting in a Roman sewer. These run underneath London, or this section of London. They're all over the place. They're all draining into the Thames. Um, and they still work today. And we still use them today. Not for sewerage now, but for surface water. So rainwater goes back into the river. Um, they're still working. We repair them. And they're fantastic. I can't see modern ones lasting this long all built with brick and tile uh, we go a little bit here a bit further ahead so this will be you know London in the 13 13 to 14 hundreds um, you can see the Tower of London is now built and there's a hospital St Catherine there that's now called St Catherine's Dock because um, that all became Docklands everything to the right was the main docks for, for London especially when it was the leader in the world uh, you can see there is still wall around it and there are sections of wall left today that you can go and see especially at the Museum of London but nothing really outside the wall a few bits beginning to happen but not a lot so you've got a priory um, you've got a temple middle temple which is now the law the law courts at that area um, very little on the um, south side of the river so you've got that place called Southwark, not South Walk, it's called Southwark. Um, and Lambeth Moor is just Lambeth nowadays. That is all developed, you'll see in a second. Um, a few roads radiating out, which are bringing the food, the milk, etc. into the city. And allowing for connections to York and Peterborough and Wales and Bath. Well, come a little bit further ahead so now we're in London we're in um, Tudor times um, notice south of the river is beginning to develop a little bit now uh, still only got one bridge lots of shipping going on but it's beginning to spread slowly and that's in 1572 um, this is the most modern one I'm going to pop you in it's not a very good copy admittedly but this is a Victorian London and it has exploded so what were villages are now part of London uh, so a lot of the areas a lot of the suburbs in London you see the names they're the names of villages that used to exist and after the great fire of London 
when, and you can see that's in the yellow colour, the area destroyed by the Great Fire. Uh, this was the proposed plan for rebuilding London by Sir, by Sir, Sir Christopher Wren. Um, he liked the Palladian um, layout, uh, the, the dead straight rows, all radiating from a piazza on the left and from an uh, exchange on the right. Nice idea, would have worked really well. Uh, some cities abroad, and Paris adopted this a little bit, uh, Bucharest did, a few other places uh, produced this, this sort of layout here. He never got completely built in this way, bits of it were, were built, um, but he did manage to get quite a lot of uh, churches built. So you can see, there you go, more bridges now, and that's today. Um, obviously a modern map here because it's got HMS Belfast down the bottom there and that but that's the area that burnt down and that was the proposal uh, industrial cities so we've got we've, we've moved away from traditional towns and cities which were based which were based on major rivers or coasts for trade etc and then they developed quite organically, quite naturally. They expanded, expanded, and as peace was more normal, they, they were no longer constricted inside their walls. Um, so now we're into sort of like the 18th, 19th century. We're into the Industrial Revolution. We'll just look at Manchester. I've only got one thing to show you for Manchester, and that's a photograph. Um, this is when the population started moving from the countryside into the cities to find work. And you'd end up with conditions such as this, back-to-back -back housing. Um, there'd be several, several families living in each room of these buildings. Uh, unsanitary conditions, no real sewage treatment, no real fresh water. Uh, right next to where they're working, they're, they're all the mills with their um, coal-powered, coal um, uh, what do you call them? Well, the, the coal-fired manufacturing machinery and the people would go to work there, they'd come back these would be privately owned, it would cost them most of their money to rent them they'd probably have trouble finding enough food uh, schools were not really heard of, people didn't get to school very often they didn't have hospitals, particularly in doctors, these were cramped in, they were very badly built um, cholera outbreaks were quite common so that's, that's what the Industrial Revolution produced. However, there were industrialists in Victorian times who thought differently um, to these ones. We have model villages, and I've got two examples of model villages of very forward-looking um, employers, industrialists. Nice little cottages, look beautifully, beautifully built. One family per house. They've got gardens at the front and back. And this is a salt air. So Sir Titus Salt, uh, he was an industrialist in uh, Yorkshire, uh, the woolen industry. This is why obviously we, we call all our bed sheets and that Manchester here, because it must have been made there originally. Um, he felt for the conditions of his workers. Um, he realised they weren't getting, they weren't getting uh, education and health treatment and they were crammed in. So he decided to develop a model village for them to live in and he relocated them out of the city and they all lived here and he relocated these mills to this area as well and it's a, it's a very nice area to this day. Um, don't be fooled though because treating his workers really well meant he got higher productivity out of them as well um, and it reduced accidents and, and deaths in the factories so there was a capitalist benefit to this. Um, so in 1851, the first ones were opened for him, uh, and it's an example of what's known as the enlightened 19th century urban planning. Um, these houses were actually owned by Sir Titus, so the rents were controlled by him. They weren't overly expensive. In these villages, he provided schools, community centres, a hospital, parks. They were all provided for them. Another example, um, there's one downside to this one, which I'll tell you at the end of it. This one, it, they weren't all like little Tudor looking um, things, but this was chocolate 
basically, George Cadbury. So in 1893, some time after, after Sir Titus, um, he bought half a square kilometre of land next to his factories, and at his own cost, and it was at Sir Titus's own cost as well, he built Bourneville, which is a model village. And he said that was to alleviate the evils of modern, more cramped living conditions. Uh, by 1900, the estate had grown to 113 cottages and houses, and again, he provided community centres, hospitals, schools, parks. So it was all dealt with for you there. Now, the downside of Bourneville is because they were Quakers, and to this day, actual Bourneville itself is a dry area. So there is no alcohol sold, there are no pubs. Um, it's quite a large home brew area. So... Garden cities are the next thing we came on to, and the model villages led slightly towards this. Um, garden cities have had a very large influence in Europe, in America, um, and a little bit in Australia, as you'll see. So it's called a movement that came along. So the garden city movement uh, is a method of urban planning that came up at, uh, you know, at the end of the century, 1898, by a brilliant name, Sir Ebenezer Howard. I was like Ebenezer, like Ebenezer Scrooge, but he wasn't Scrooge. Uh, and it came up in the UK first of all, and then it was exported. Um, garden cities were intended to be planned, so they didn't grow organically as needed. They were deliberately planned, self-contained communities, surrounded by a green belt, i.e. land that could not, be built, could not be developed or built on. And we still have them in Britain, but there's a lot of pressure to build on them nowadays. Um, and these green belts contained residences, industry, agriculture, uh, also gave a lot of leisure activity by going out to the Greenbelt area. Um, ideally, Ebenezer reckoned that his garden city should accommodate about 32,000 people uh, on a site of about 6,000 acres. Now that's, that's really generous, that's quite a low density of occupation. They're planned on a concentric pattern with open spaces, public parks, um, generally six boulevards radiate from a centre, and there is a, his original basic design was this. So this is a, at the top notice, it's a group of slumless, smokeless cities. This one was aimed to have a population of 250,000 if he'd gone for this one, or 66,000 acres. So you've got bang in the centre of the city, that's where you'd have your commercial centre, etc. You reckon you'd have 58,000 people living in there, they'd be in slightly denser housing than those further out. Um, I like the fact that there's somewhere for me to go and live there, because there's an insane asylum, which would be perfect for me. And then you've got farms and forests, uh, reservoir and waterfall, you can come out, there's allotments where you can grow your own food. So it's a lovely idea. Remember that, that pattern, these round, round areas connected by straight boulevards or roads. Uh, he's got an inner circular railway to connect them all. Um, these were beginning to, and this was Philadelphia by the way, these designs were only brought about and were only practical by the development of mass transport, i.e. railways, and they became quite usable when uh, horseless buses and trams came along. Um, unfortunately, then we all got cars, and it sort of fell apart a bit after that. So, Canberra, just to prove to you, look at the map of Canberra. Can you see anything that looks familiar there? Do you think there's a bit of garden movement influence there with circles and straight lines and satellite circles they had a really good go they followed it as closely as they could really uh, Walter Burley Griffin we all know him because the late's called that uh, in 1912 that's his plan for the Garden City of Canberra he's followed the Garden City planning principles to underpin these residential areas. Um, those residential areas remain today and they're highly sought after because they're very livable. 
He insisted that they had to have good access to parks for recreation and access to their workplace, were fundamental to the design of this. Doesn't mean they had to walk to work, they, they could get the bus, the tram. Um, the streets that allowed people to walk to trolley buses that would be running up and down the main avenue, so they'd be going in and out, taking you into the areas. This is before it became heavily uh, diplomatic. Uh, present walled settlements. We haven't stopped living in walled settlements. Um, just a couple to mention to you. Obviously, we're all aware of security enclosed residential developments. Uh, there's there's a few of those down on the Gold Coast. There's a there's a couple near me in uh, Cleveland, and they're everywhere. You end up buying a house where you have to have a code to, to open the open the gates to drive in, and the gates shut behind you, and there's a fence around it or a wall. So they're very popular in America, and they even have armed guards protecting them not to let the bad people in. Uh, aged care facilities are an example. Um, the people are not locked up, but they are for their own safety, make them feel safe. They're normally within a, a fenced or walled community. Schools. You only have to look at a modern school to see it's, it's a walled settlement, basically. Um, when I was a kid, they weren't surrounded by them, but now they're surrounded by two metre high fences, maybe a bit higher. And it's weird. And you can go on about this as much as you like, and you can look at them on the internet, and, you know, we still haven't got away from them. Whether we're coming full circle and things are becoming more dangerous and we're going to have more of these is another question. Um, sustainable development, just to finish off for you. Uh, 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development, and a lovely German Brundtland Commission, as it is known, gave a very good definition of sustainable development, which we should remember, and it's in layman's English. It's not fluffy and clever, not like um, that lovely description of a manual shovel that was on one of the videos I gave you a while ago. And it said, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Um, we don't ruin the environment. We don't use up all the resources. Very simple. Can't go wrong if you remember that one. And if you've got any questions, remember the Q&A forum is probably the best place to do them. Leave you alone with one of my photos again. Um, typical English, or oh, that's not Cornwall, but it's somewhere around there. Nice steep stairs, little stone buildings, and of course, the traditional English food. Curry, an English curry. There's a pub at the top there, the Cherubin, that one is. So. Um, I hope you've um, picked something up on this. Make sure you read the readings that are provided on the Moodle site. Uh, they go into this in a little bit more detail. They've got some better pictures as well. Um, and questions coming up, then uh, you can start asking them. And I'm going to turn my attention to marking the assignments later on today. So um, hope to see you at the tutorial this week.